the Yorkshire and Humber, um, uh, NIHR Yorkshire and Humber Patient Safety uh, Research Collaboration. I'm Rebecca Lawton and I'm the director of the uh, Yorkshire and Humber Collaboration for um, Patient Safety Research. And I'm absolutely delighted to be able to um, welcome um, Ian Leistico today to present on value-driven regulation of healthcare, health and care quality in the Netherlands. I've been following Ian's work for probably about 15 years uh, now, and he's written extensively about regulation in healthcare, about patient involvement um, in healthcare, and um, how we should more effectively and collaboratively um, be regulating um, healthcare uh, organisations. And so I'm really delighted that he's taken the time today uh, to come and speak to us about some of his recent work in this area. Ian is um, an inspector and advisor at the Dutch Health and Youth Care Inspectorate, and at the same time is professor at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, where he um, conducts uh, research and supervises research into governmental regulation of health and care quality. He's a non-practicing physician, and in 2011, Ian became member of the Programme Advisory Committee of the International Forum on Quality and Safety in Healthcare, a conference, uh, an organisation that many of us uh, attend and are, are members of. And Ian's also a board member of SYNC, which is an international collaboration of European health and care regulars, regulators. So he is um, an absolute expert in this uh, area across, across Europe. And as an academic, uh, Ian teaches and publishes about patient safety and the role of regulation. And he's published a book um, back in 2017, actually, on um, prevention being better than cure, which is about learning from uh, adverse events. And if you haven't already done so, I would very strongly recommend um, a paper that Ian wrote, I think probably about 13 years ago now, um, with the title, uh, Patient Safety is a Tough Nut to Crack. So if you haven't read that one, it was it certainly inspired uh, uh, me and, and some of the work that I did. And I would uh, strongly recommend that, along with uh, many of Ian's uh, other publications. Before I hand over to Ian, just a couple of housekeeping uh, comments, please. If people could turn their mics off, cameras on is absolutely fine. Um, although please note that this uh, session is being recorded and will be posted on the uh, Yorkshire Quality and Safety Research Group YQSR YouTube uh, channel. So you can view it afterwards and you can also direct colleagues to go and have a look at it there. Um, we, are, we are recording this, so please keep your microphones off. If you do have any questions, um, what we prefer you to do is uh, not to uh, put your hand up and ask them during the uh, uh, presentation, but if you could just pop them in chat, um, we will pick them up at the end and um, we'll ask them of, of Ian then and we'll, um, we'll, we'll make sure those uh, questions are, are raised. Okay, so without further ado then, um, thank you again Ian for um, coming along to talk to us today and I would like to hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca, for your for your kind words. Um, OK, um, now we just practice with sharing my screen, which should work. There we go. Um, yeah, so uh, hi, everybody. My name is Ian. Uh, I'm coming to you from uh, Utrecht, the Netherlands, which is right in the center of the Netherlands. It's actually sunny today, so that's nice. And I'm in my home, and this is a uh, a poster on my wall. So this is not the view that I have out from my from my window. It's Lake Como in Italy, and I put out that poster when we started working online during COVID because I thought that people have something nice to look at instead of my head uh, when they're video calling with me. So um, anyway, um, as Debbie, uh, as uh, Rebecca said, I, I uh, have uh, two jobs simultaneously at the healthcare inspectorate and at the university, which is a, um, an honor uh, because I can combine research with practice that way. What I will um, talk to you about is the, the, the concept of value-driven regulation. Uh, I'll give an example. Uh, then I'll, sh I'll go through a couple of research phases that we went through regarding um, engaging 
patients or users in adverse event investigations. And I'll end with summing up the research program that we are currently uh, doing within the Dutch Health and Youth Care Inspectorate, because we have a, a research program, a small research program within the inspectorate. Um, that will be just brief, but then if you have any interests in any of these research projects, you can reach out to me and we can uh, we can connect. So that's the idea of my presentation. All right. Um, yeah, so in Roman times, when uh, the emperor would have a triumphal parade through, uh, through Rome, there would be a slave standing behind him with a laurel wreath over his head saying, you are only human, you are only human. Um, so 2000 years ago, we already knew that people in power can lose touch of reality. And I feel that this, this is one of the roles that a regulator has. Uh, certainly in healthcare, but probably in all regulatory fields, uh, we regulate uh, people, but also companies, uh, uh, institutions that have a lot of power uh, and that do things that should be doing good things for people with less power, patients, users, families, etc. And to keep that power balance uh um to to kind of check have checks and balances for that power balance i think the regulator has a has a big role uh, so this is one of the reasons why i uh, decided to join the regulator and as some of my doctor friends said uh turn over to the dark side uh, <laughs> as they sometimes have a bit of a, a negative um picture of what regulation is I believe regulation is something very positive and uh, it uh, helps to create societal value. At least it should, and uh, often it doesn't. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we investigate what we do and do research on it to see if we can do it better. Just to give you a quick overview, the Dutch Health and Youth Care Inspector is basically a little bit like the CQC and the GMC and all the other professional regulators that you have in England. Um, so we have them combined. So we oversee monitor, regulate both healthcare professionals and organizations in all, all uh, sectors of healthcare, public health, acute care, primary care, also manufacturers and distributors of laboratories. So that's the MHRA, I believe, in your country. Uh, also youth care, long-term care. Um, so that's a, a lot of different sectors and a lot of different laws and a lot of different types of regulations that, that we oversee. Um, about uh, yeah, two years ago, we published an article describing value-driven regulation. In that article, we had a different graph picture than we have in this uh, in this slide because we kind of worked on it further, also within the Dutch Health and Youth Care Inspectorate. Uh, and our goal was to really um, find a way to keep the eye on the ball, uh, being societal value. So to, um, to find a way to help our inspectors to develop policy and um, strategies that keep societal value at the forefront, that, that is our goal. Because what happens uh, uh, in every regulator, maybe every company, every organization is at some point you organize stuff and then the way you work kind of becomes your goal instead of what you set up to, to have impact on. Um, um, so that's why we built this. So basically it starts with societal value that translates into an issue. What is it exactly that you want to uh, impact as a, a regulator? Then you have to gather in intelligence and interpret that intelligence and develop an intervention. Then you do your intervention. Then you evaluate the effect or the impact of that evaluation using again intelligence and interpreting that intelligence and that should have impact on the issue. And if it does not, then you need to change your uh, uh, intervention. And if it does, then at some point you might be able to stop your intervention. And all the time you have to keep in mind is, is my impact on the issue also positively impacting the societal value that we wanted to have an effect on. And I will give you a concrete example. Um, so I'll run you through this slide because it looks like a chaos, but uh, we'll start in the left, in the upper left corner. So if you say as a societal value, and maybe this is not the right wording, so, but if you say uh, patients receive the right care in hospitals, that is a societal value. We, as a society, value 
the idea that when patients come to the hospitals <laughs> that they receive the care they should be receiving. Uh, then you will understand that that is a very, very broad uh, theme. So there's no way you could impact that with a strategy because it's just too big. So if you want to show your societal value, you need to make this smaller uh, into something that you can actually impact as a regulator. That's the issue. So at some point, many years ago, we chose as an issue that hospitals should comply to the stroke guideline. Now, this is an old example, but I'm showing it because I have some nice graphs that can that can show you the impact of what we did. So basically what we had is we had meetings with medical specialist societies. So the Society for Surgery, the Society for, in this case, the Society for Neurology. And they said, you know, we have this guideline for stroke that you have to give thrombolysis within one hour, but it's very difficult to get people to comply to the guideline. So we thought, okay, um, let's make this a national indicator. And then we will gather information about the door to needle time. So the time it takes to give thrombolysis to the patient. Uh, and the guideline is you should do that within one hour. So just for the people without a medical background, if you have a stroke, you have a little blood clot in a vein in your, in your brain. That means that everything behind that blood clot does not get oxygen anymore. And that's not good. And the neurologists say time is brain. So you need to take that blood clot away. So the blood streams again and gives oxygen to that part of the brain. And one way of taking that blood clot away is by thrombolysis. So you inject something into a patient that takes away the blood clot and then the brain is, um, is okay again. And you have to do that really quick because the longer you take to do that, the more brain damage will, uh, will occur. I hope that's enough explanation for the non-medical people uh, in, in a minute, in a brief time. Okay, so we did that um, as a quality indicator we published the data we had meetings with boards members about, you know, this is you and uh, in regards to, uh, to the other hospitals, how do you think you're doing? Uh, could you be improving? Uh, and again, we then looked at the door to needle time to see if it was improving. Now, I have to tell you, we did this many years ago before we had the concept of value driven regulation. So this, the, the way I fit it into the model is with hindsight. But the idea, I think, fits. Um, uh, this example fits the idea of, of uh, value driven regulation. So I'll show you some, some graphs now. So every dot here is a hospital. And the vertical line is the percentage of patients that got thrombolysis within one hour. So the percentage of patients that got the type of care that we planned to give them. As, as a society said, this is, this is what we want. And the horizontal line is the number of patients. So you see a lonely dot here that, that I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse, probably not. Oh, you can? Okay, good. So this, this, uh, this is hospital. It had treated uh, 75 patients and about 40% uh, uh, of those patients got thrombolysis within one hour. Um, so that's not great. And basically, if you look at it, uh, um, we say in Dutch, there's a schot hagel. It's a shot of, I don't know, like, what, with, your, with your hunting rifle. Is it hail? I don't know what it's called. It's a, when you shoot with a hunting rifle, you have all these little pieces of lead going out. Well, that's what this looks like. And basically, you're delivered to the gods when you have a stroke in 2008, because the hospital you are sent to by the ambulance has a huge impact on your survival rate and your morbidity rate. So this is 2008 uh, when we started this, and I will go through a couple of years. Eight, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, wrong way. Yeah, eight, nine, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So here you see that in four years time, we, um, improve the average of about 65% to 90%. And important, more important, maybe, you see that the uh, average score of 2008, so these hospitals would say, well, we are, we're doing pretty well because we're average, is actually, four years later, the, the lowest score of the hospitals. So it kind of proves that uh, within pretty quick time, a short time, you can up the whole country, the whole nation in quality, if you focus uh, on something specific. Um, uh, and in this case, uh, also have a good collaboration between the regulator and the professional societies who came up with the, this, this issue. They said, we want, we want to change this. 
So this is an example of impact that you can have as a regulator. And this is one of the reasons why I really love my job. And I think we're doing some great stuff. Um, but of course, I'm showing you a good example. I could have shown you a lot of bad examples mm -hmm. of uh, uh, graphs that do not show impact or uh, interviews with people who say uh, this really does not help. So there's a lot of themes out there that we could certainly improve on. This one is a nice one, and it shows you how value driven regulation could work. OK. So um, in that value driven regulation model, you see the issue, the, the, the center bubble. And the center bubble is basically uh, um, contains three elements. It contains the regulatory object. That is the translation of societal value into something concrete that we want to change, a gap between what we see and what we would like to see. We want to close that gap. That, that is the regulatory object. So in this case, uh, it was uh, the, the, the door to needle time for people with, uh, with the stroke. The standard is the professional standard or the guideline or the law that applies to this situation. And the addressee is the uh, actor that we address as a regulator to say, you need to abide to the standard so we can attain that regulatory object. And we call that address C and not regulate T because an address C can be more than just the regulate T. So the regulate T is the actor that we have a regulatory relationship with, a hospital, a pharmacist. But an address C could be, for example, the, uh, um, the healthcare insurance company in the Netherlands or a, uh, um, a town council uh, um, or, or some other party that has impact on how our regulatees, our healthcare providers are able to provide care. So this is also one of the insights that we had. We said we shouldn't just focus on our regulatees. We should look at why our regulatee is not able to create the quality of care that we think is, is, is important. What other actors are influencing our regulatees and could we influence those actors to create the, the, the context in which our regulatees can deliver the care that we want them to deliver. This still makes sense. Um, okay, and otherwise we have time for questions at the end. Yeah. So regulating healthcare quality is all about the question, who is doing what to create which societal value? Who, the address C, what the standard the regulatory object, the societal value? So basically, if you can answer the question, who should be doing what to create which societal value, then regulation is pretty straightforward because you go to that actor, you say, are you doing it? No, you should be doing it, or what you need to be doing it, etc. But life isn't always that easy. So more and more, we uh, are confronted with situations in which the who, the what, or the which societal value isn't clear to us. For example, uh, the um, um, selling of uh, illegal uh, pharmaceuticals through internet, we do not know who is doing that. And even if we did know, it's a website and it's probably somewhere on the Bahamas. So we don't have any influence on it. Um, the uh, question of if two hospitals merge, is that good or bad for the care quality? We know who we should be talking to, the hospital board. We, we don't know what the standards should be for that or what which society very exactly we should be aiming for. So there's tons of examples of situations where the regulator can't really, um, excuse me, uh, use the classic compliance-based regulation models, uh, which are really, uh, uh, which, for which you need to know who should be doing what to create which society value. And one of these themes is how patients, users are involved in adverse events, adverse events investigations. So what I want to do with you now is walk through a couple of research projects that we've done uh, in the past and end with one that, that was uh, published last year uh, to show you how our development as a regulator in trying to understand the issue of uh, engaging patients in uh, adverse event investigations. And for that, it's, I think, good to know that in the Netherlands, it is mandatory for all healthcare organizations to report serious adverse events to us. 
uh, within three days. If they do not comply to that and we find out, we can give them a fine. Um, and we, we can have a whole hour discussion on the usefulness of that fine. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is the case. So they need to report it to us. And we give them about eight weeks to do an investigation. They can take longer if they want longer. They can ask for more time. They do the, in, uh, send the serious adverse event investigation, the analysis. They send that, invest, uh, that analysis report to us. And we then judge the quality of that analysis report. So that's how it's organized now in the Netherlands and how it has been organized for quite some time. And at some point we said, hmm, uh, should, we should shift our, our focus from the content of the adverse event to the learning process in the wake of the adverse event. Um, so when I joined the inspectorate about 13 years ago, we would ask content-based questions. So what was the blood pressure of the patient? Why did you give this medication and not that medication? Uh, uh, did the nurse have the right to training, stuff like that. And we decided, okay, this isn't really working because we're getting answers which don't answer the question we really, really have. And we should switch from the content to the process. How are they learning? Have they, do they have a multidisciplinary team? Are they using a certain specific uh, analysis method like root cause analysis? Uh, are, have they engaged the right people? Uh, are they, and also are they engaging the patient? And do they have uh, peer support? Uh, and does the board of directors do something with the with the uh, with the outcome of this investigation? There's these questions that we judge. So one of the questions there was: Are you engaging patients in your sentinel event, your serious adverse event analysis? Um, so this is the first publication in 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 a, in a row. This is 2016 in BMJ Quality and Safety and um, one citation is since 2013, the IGZ, that was how we were called then, has been pushing hospitals to engage the patient or a patient representative in sentinel event analysis. So sentinel event means serious adverse event. This provides the IGZ with an external check on the report's validity. In the, the sense that if the patient has to is engaged, the patient will also check whether this is valid what the hospital is doing. But it might also increase the hospital's unease because they have to be open with the patient about what happened and what they're learning from it. So this aspect deserves further research. So here you see the classic researcher uh, ending. <laughs> More research is needed. Uh, but um, so since 2013, we said to the hospitals, you need to engage patients. And we saw that because we receive all these reports, these, uh, these uh, analysis reports. And if the patient, if the, there was no note of a patient being engaged, we sent a letter back to the hospital said, you need to engage the patient next time for this and this reason. And if by the third time they still didn't do it, we went over there and told them they should be doing this. Um, and you have to know we have quite some, potentially we have a lot of power. So hospitals do tend to at some point do what we tell them to do otherwise they get into trouble um so this was 2016. um we also looked at how patients were engaged in um, mental health uh, adverse events which are often suicides um unfortunately and we looked into how our patients and families engaged in the analysis of the suicide and we saw that the respondents so people that were interviewed for this study argue that involving patients and families is valuable to help deal with the event emotionally, provide additional information and prevent escalation. In practice, involvement consists mostly of providing aftercare and sharing information about the event by providers. So basically this means that when a patient commits suicide, of course they tell the, the, the family, but they don't engage the family in the whole in analysis and at the end, they provide aftercare, so what, what do you, uh, how are you doing? Is everything okay? And this is what we uh, analyze, et cetera. And what they also said was that um, family were often not involved in the care for patients in the mental health uh, institutions, and they would rather be involved in the care in the first place. And then it would be natural to also be involved in serious adverse events like a suicide. But if you only involve them once the patient has committed suicide, it's kind of too late. Uh, on uh, for, for, the, for the family. So this um, was an investigation specifically in mental health. 
the other was hospitals. So we continue with hospitals now. And here you see the graph of the uh, percentage of hospital adverse event reports stating that patients or family were engaged in the incident investigation. And you see that when we started in 2013, that was less than 20%. Uh, and the red line is the percentage of uh, that which was clear that they were not engaged. And in some cases, it wasn't clear. So that's the um, the, um, the blue line. And there's a gray line of, of not applicable in the sense that that some events don't don't have patients. So that those are more technical kind of things that went wrong. So what we saw is when, once we started telling hospitals you need to engage patients, you saw an enormous increase and basically within two, three years, it was 80%. It was the norm to engage patients, um, which you could frame as a successful uh, regulatory intervention. But you are all researchers, so you all have tons of questions when you see graphs like this, and, and so you should. Um, so um, we went out and did some more research and uh, uh, and Joshua Koch interviewed, uh, I think, uh, 13 uh, hospitals about uh, how, how then is this done? So how are uh, uh, patients involved um, and, 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 and what um, and what kind of challenges are, are, are hospitals facing when they, when they involve them? And a citation is family involvement in incident investigations is typically organized as a one-time interview event. Interviews with patients or their families were considered to be valuable and important in their own right and seen as a way to do justice to the individual needs of the patient or their family. Yet the usefulness and validity of the patient or family perspective for incident investigation was often seen to be limited. So they often spoke to them once said, well, it's useful to speak to them because it's a way to do justice to their needs. They feel heard. But basically what they're telling me isn't really of added value. Uh, and what we also saw is that if the doctor says uh, something happened at uh, 12 o'clock and the patient said, no, it happened at 1230, then the report will say it happened at 12 o'clock because the uh, doctor's version of the story is given more uh, validity uh, than the patient's. So this um, led to more research. Um, and this is like a, a, a sidestep uh, together with a historian. I looked at how patients are involved in patient safety and, and how that uh, kind of, um, how you can compare that to how patients are involved in healthcare uh, and that, that the, um, that inter the, the, the interest for this came actually because my mother is a nurse or she was, yeah, she's alive, but she doesn't practice as a nurse anymore. So she worked as a nurse. And it, when she was taught to become a nurse, when she there was a nursing school in the, in the end of the 1960s, nurses were not told that the patient had cancer. And the patients weren't told that they had cancer. So basically the patient didn't know what he had and even the nurse didn't know. And uh, everybody was okay with that. Uh, and so in the 60 years, 50 years since my mother was a nurse, and now we saw that first the patients weren't told what their disease was at all. Then they were told. Then they were kind of given, uh, but they were told, what, and this is how we're going to treat it. Then they were given a choice in the treatment. They were given informed consent. And now uh, with many healthcare uh, uh, situations, it's about what matters to you instead of what matters. What's the matter? I mean, so what matters to you is what, what is the matter? Uh, and you kind of see the same development in patient safety. When I was studying medicine, we weren't even told something went wrong. And we certainly didn't tell the patients. We said, you know, it, it's, this is uh, an allergic reaction when we gave too, too much medication or something like that. Not, not out of bad will, but probably because of awkwardness or we didn't know what to do with it. At some point, we started telling patients that stuff went wrong, but we will do the investigation for you. Then at some point, we started engaging patients in that investigation, uh, giving them a choice. And, and maybe in the future, uh, we should be asking them what is important for you uh, in regard to this uh, event that went wrong and that has such an impact on you. Instead of that, we as a healthcare uh, sector decide how to uh, go about this. 
So this article kind of describes these two uh, developments, which I see a lot of parallels in. Um, but we went on, uh, oh yeah, and, and this this is a, a, a large research, which is published in Dutch, unfortunately, but there is a publication in English, which I'll show in a moment, uh, in which we looked at, okay, this whole incident investigation, why are we doing this? Why are we regulating adverse events at all? How did it start? Uh, what was the plan? Uh, how's, it, uh, how's it working out for us? And this is a big report, 100 pages, uh, uh, commissioned by us. Uh, but the question, does the regulation of serious adverse events work out? And the, basically, I mean, of course, not doing justice to the report by uh, uh, summarizing it in one sentence, uh, but basically it said, yes, it has had a lot of impact, but now it's losing its impact because the effect is kind of plateauing and you should be asking new questions, new things. Um, so this is one of the articles that came out of this study. Um, and uh, in 2020, it said the IRS, the Incident Reporting System, so that's the system in which hospitals have to report to the regulator and the regulator does something with that report. The Incident Reporting System contributed to the increased involvement of patients and families, as you saw on the graph earlier, but involving patients and families in sentinel event investigations is not the same as learning from them. While patients and family members are increasingly involved, their input is not always valued by the investigators, as we discussed earlier. And um, that led to more questions. And uh, this is a 2022 publication about epistemic injustice. So at some point, we came across the term epistemic injustice. And we thought, wow, this kind of fits what this we're struggling with. Uh, and in this article, uh, Josje describes, despite initiatives to facilitate inclusiveness, research shows that embracing and learning from diverse perspectives is difficult. Rather than repeat calls to involve more and listen better, we encourage policymakers to be mindful of and address the structures that can cause epistemic injustice. So in this article, uh, we describe the structures that can cause epistemic injustice. So for example, because the regulator says the investigation has to be completed in eight weeks. Sometimes it's difficult to engage the family because the family isn't ready to talk about the adverse event within those eight weeks because they are still trying to get a grip of the fact that their loved one has passed. Um, because we say a committee should be doing this investigation, they, the hospital makes a committee, mostly of doctors, senior people, and these senior people interview junior people who have been involved in an incident, uh, and these junior people don't feel comfortable to really tell them what went, what was going on, or if they do, these senior people don't really understand what they're trying to say because they don't emphasize and uh, 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 understand well enough what a junior person is going through in, in the daily work. So the structures can, even though people really want to do right and want to do well, the structures, the way we organize these kind of investigations can create uh, epistemic injustice. Um, so, and now I'm nearly at the end of my presentation now. Uh, so last year we said, okay, so here we have a couple of problems. We're really trying to get the hospitals to engage patients and all healthcare providers, but just focusing on hospitals here, engage patients in a serious adverse events analysis. We see that they're doing that more. We see a beautiful graph, but actually when we look behind the graph, we see a lot of problems. We see epistemic injustice. We see people being listened to, but not heard. Uh, people being included at the end of the, uh, of, of the whole process instead of at the beginning. So how now are hospitals doing this? Uh, so we asked NIVO, which is a research institute in the Netherlands, to in investigate that. The question of how do hospitals involve patients and families in the aftermath of a serious adverse event? And there we saw a very broad range of uh, ways they do this. They all involve patients, mostly because they have to, because we told them to. Uh, but they all feel that it's useful once they started doing it. But the way they involve it is at the one end, uh, they tell them something went wrong, we're going to investigate it. And two months later, they invite them to share the report, say, this is our investigation report. You can read it in this room. There's going to be somebody standing behind you to make sure you're not taking any pictures of it. 
and uh, then you can leave again and good luck. Um, to the other end that um, they tell them something went wrong, they say we're going to do an investigation and we would really like to involve you. What do you need to be involved in this investigation? And what questions do you have? And what would you like us to look into uh, when we investigate this? And involve them all the way and at the end give them the report either in the, uh, the, the, the version that the hospital makes or make a better readable version for patients uh, or, or their families. So that's the, the broad spectrum, basically, of, of how hospitals deal with this now. Um, and interestingly enough, in this research, uh, they concluded that the um, added that there was added value of the patient's perspective in these adverse event uh, uh, um, analysis. Well, earlier research said, no, we don't really see added value here. They did see added value. So something has changed over the years that uh, uh, in that perspective. So the regulating healthcare quality is about who's doing what to create which society value. This is the big challenge we have as a regulator to, to find out what it is, to, to make this as explicit as possible. Because only if we make this explicit, we can see if we as a regulator are having the impact that we want to have. Uh, then one more slide, just to quickly go through what kind of research are we doing now. Uh, we're looking into geographical influence of quality. So we have a couple of islands out of the coast of the Netherlands, and they have general practitioners, uh, and they have a very different working situation than on the mainland. So we're looking into how come, or what do they, and what do the patients on those islands feel is important with regard to quality in, uh, of care. We're looking at learning and improvement capability of organizations. What, what does that consist of and how could we impact that? We're looking at the interplay of regulation and criminology. So sometimes people in healthcare do stuff that's really bad and uh, that we have to uh, talk with the public prosecutor about. Uh, and and uh, where do we draw the line uh, and how does, that, uh, how does that work out? We look into leadership's behavior on the impact on care quality. We look at appreciation of nurses. How are they appreciated and how do they feel appreciated in their work? Sustainable employability is a big issue in the Netherlands, as it is, I think, in very many countries. So what do, in this case, doctors need to uh, stay fit and employable in their job? And how could we as a regulator impact that positively? Reflexive regulation is a big theme in our, uh, in our research program. The safety science and incident investigation is something new. We're trying to see if, if we include more safety science perspectives. Does that improve what we get out of incident investigation? The legitimacy of, the legitimacy of standards. And just before the meeting, we talked to this briefly. We look at what makes a professional standard legitimate or not. And that is because there are now people standing up saying, we are also a professional society and making standards that uh, other doctors would frown upon. <laughs> um, uh, and we are looking into regulating the unexpected, uh, as I'm calling it now. So how can we um, help healthcare providers anticipate the unanticipatable? Uh, like we had a pandemic and now everybody's looking, oh, how can we make sure that the next pandemic we will be prepared? But of course, the next big disruptive thing will probably not be a pandemic. So how can we uh, help um, healthcare providers cope with that and, and also what, what is our own role. Then for you who are interested in this, uh, know that you are welcome to join us at the Erasmus Sink Scientific Symposium. This is a, a, a very small conference, so it makes 40 people. We are now 30 people signed up, a little over 30 people. It's free of charge. Um, and it's on Wednesday, June 5th in Utrecht, which is a beautiful city. I live there, so I'm a bit biased. And if you want to sign up, uh, uh, the, the PowerPoint will be sent to you after this lecture and on the PowerPoint there's a link and you can sign up and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Right, thank you very much. Back to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Ian. What a fantastic talk and, and um, I would strongly recommend Utrecht as a, as a city to visit. So, uh, so please do uh, think about going along uh, to the events that um, Ian advertised there. I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions. I, I have a few and uh, really appreciate the time you've taken, Ian, to run through a really broad um, 
uh, kind of overview of a number of really important issues um, in healthcare, how to regulate, how to involve patients, how to learn better from uh, incidents and, and adverse events uh, investigations. So you've covered a lot of territory uh, there. So thank you for that. Do we have um, any questions? I think Jenny's got a hand up there, Rebecca. Yeah, sorry, I'm on I'm on spotlight, so I can't see uh, the people who are uh, in the room, but I can see Jenny's hand there. Jenny, over to you. Um, thank you, and that's a really fantastic presentation. Brilliantly clear, and um, it covered a lot of ground, but with depth as well. So thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed two questions. I'll I'll pick I'll pick my favourite first, and then. And then if I'm allowed to ask a second question, I'd like to ask that as well, please. Um, so looking at the serious incident investigation example, um, I suppose you you yourself brought it back to the situation with mental health and people um, taking, having, uh, taking their own lives and the point that you made about um, the families are rarely involved in the care of patients um, while they're alive. So I, I would take a step further and, and really, I suppose my question really is, um, when people themselves are rarely involved in their own care within the hospital prior to an event, and the default is to not be involved, then how do we transition over to post events to encourage their involvement? Um, so how so the so is the answer to being able to fully support involvement post event to be able to involve them more clearly pre event? Um, yeah, Jenny, thank you for your compliments and your and your question. I, I totally agree. I think that I think that's I think that would really help. I think uh, if you uh, normalize involvement of people within their healthcare process, then it's also normal to involve them when stuff goes wrong. And uh, if you start involving them when something's gone wrong, you're kind of uh, two zero behind in football terms uh, because you need uh, to create a relationship first. And you don't have that relationship yet then, uh, or you don't have the you don't have the kind of relationship you need to uh, to do the yeah. I think I think the interaction uh, needed to collaborate on learning from an adverse event is a very different one than the interaction needed to collaborate in someone's healthcare. Um, and so if you don't involve people properly in that healthcare, then it's even more difficult to involve them properly in uh, adverse event investigations, I, I would think. Thank you. Can, yeah, yeah, can I ask my second question? Yeah, sure. Sorry, Sorry Rebecca. Um, so, um, Obviously, what you've been doing is um, plotting and tracking and, and gathering intelligence about the extent to which um, patients have been involved in serious incident investigation. Have you been able to link that up at all to um, rates of litigation? Um, yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> I understand the the, the answer is no, um, and that is. Also, because we don't have the data on litigation, uh, but uh, we the data that is out there. So most data on yeah, you have to, like, two kinds of litigation. Basically, you have the litigation in that you go to the uh, insurance company and say I want money, and you have the litigation. But maybe that's not the English word litigation. Is that you go to a judge and say I want these people punished. Um, so um, the insurance companies they say that mostly the people who come to us are the people who uh, feel they are not heard, they're not listened to. Uh, and I can relate to that. So the people that escalate up to the healthcare inspectorate, so patients or family that escalates to the healthcare inspectorate and say, you should be going out there and doing something about this are people who do not feel heard mostly. So it's more a communication problem than it is a medical issue. Um, so knowing this, the Dutch, uh, um, not the healthcare insurance, but the um, I said the the the, uh, the insurance companies that you go to if you want to get money from somebody. I don't know what the English word is for that, but um, 
uh, that the uh, claims, the claims insurance company, they they made together with lawyers and uh, healthcare providers and patient uh, uh, representatives, they made a, a document saying this is how you should go about when something goes wrong. And they say you have to be open to the patient, you have to tell them the truth, um, and um, and this is very much in contrast to the, the belief of many healthcare professionals that they believe that they can't be open because then the claims insurance company won't pay out. Uh, but the claims insurance company in Holland have made this document said you have to be open because if you're not open, we get into more trouble. That's not what they write in there. <laughs> That's basically their, their point. It costs us more money if you're not open than if you are open. Um, and they even have, a, it's a Dutch document, but they have some English words in it. They say, don't beat around the bush uh, with patients because they have, and here comes a well-tuned bullshit receptor. Um, and so just tell them the truth. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't see the direct connection between our data and, and claims data, litigation data, but this, this is what I do know. So I think there, 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 there is a relationship in engaging patients in the right way, listening to them and, and reducing the chances of claims or other court cases. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question that picks up on Isabel's uh, question and Jenny's first question takes it a little bit further. And then I'm going to come to Jane O'Hara because she's been doing a lot of work in this area. So I'm sure she's got a number of questions she wants to ask. And then Jamila and Jane Moran. And we'll see if we can ask any questions beyond that, but but maybe not. So um, you talked um, extensively about involving um, patients uh, and families in investigations. And within the um, structure of regulation that you have, which is kind of values-based uh, regulation, I, I got to thinking that um, some patients, of course, are much more willing and able to be involved in incident investigations than others. And could we end up with a system where the health service is being regulated by those patients who are willing and able to speak up and be involved in um, incident investigations? And then the voice of others who are less willing and able to speak up gets gets lost in that regulatory uh, process. And I was, I was interested to try and understand what you thought some of the unintended consequences of involving patients and perhaps not doing that very effectively. It might be. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I I, I would think that um, uh, I would give two answers to this. One is for the for the investigation of the of the adverse events. I don't think there are th this problem would 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 rise because basically this is a one off event uh, um, uh, related to one patient or one family. And they either decide to be engaged or not. I mean, they have to be invited to be engaged and, and empowered to be engaged. But if they decide not to, then that's fine. But that decision will not be influenced by other patients who have a louder voice, I think. Um, that's part one. Part two is you would want to not just involve patients when stuff goes wrong, but you'd want to somehow involve them uh, in the whole policy and structure of patient safety within an organization. And there, I think your point uh, resonates because there you have to, I, I think, be very careful about who you engage and how you empower them. Because there, I can imagine, you have the people with a loud voice that kind of um, uh, um, uh, um, claim all the, the space and not give the people with a, with a with lesser voice a space. And for us as a regulator, uh, this is a really challenging theme because we see that the people who complain to us are the people with that they, they can find us. They understand Dutch. Uh, they're mostly uh, white uh, 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 people who have lived in the Netherlands for all their life. And there's a lot of people in our society which do not have the possibility or the knowledge or uh, the guts to to uh, escalate to the inspectorate so so that's something we struggle with how, how do we get those voices heard absolutely and we don't have an answer for that one uh, yet rebecca thanks you. uh moving on to jane thank you so rebecca predictably put my hand up there um that was a great talk thank you and jenny has asked a, a couple of really important questions there i think particularly one around the sort of a seed link to litigation um 
so um, myself and some colleagues on this call have been doing some work within um, the NHS England setting, um, trying to, to improve patients and family involvement in serious incident investigations and um, done a large piece of work on that. And mostly it's focused at the sort of level of supporting individual investigators to do it. But what we saw when we um, actually tested those new processes, that much of what the struggles were, were not about sort of getting people's hearts and minds, you know, signed up to, to this, to doing this. Actually, what they saw was they quickly, they started to have problems doing those processes and engaging people in real meaningful ways within the sort of rigid systems within organisations, but also those things then that are um, influenced by outside agencies like the regulators. Yep. So, so I'm, I suppose my question is about, you know, is there a risk? It's a double-edged sword, isn't it? So regulation can, can both promote activity, as you saw in your lovely graph, and, and that, yep. you know, that the number that people are being involved is going up. But is there a risk in for regulators or how do we deal with the risk um, for regulators, for regulation more generally, um, that we don't just create so, sort of a tick box exercise yep. where organizations say that they're doing things but actually the real uh structural change that needs to happen isn't happening yeah yeah no absolutely absolutely that's um so that's the the whole uh, who's doing what uh for which society value so uh and the graph uh shows th that they are that uh, hospitals engage patients but not how they are engaging patients <laughs> So one of the things that we saw is when the graph get, gets to 80%, we should have changed our question and not asked, are you involving patients, but how are you involving patients? And that would have been qualitative data. Mm -hmm. So this is quantitative data to yes or no. Uh, but with qualitative data, you find out that there's a whole bandwidth of how they're doing this. And if, um, and, and well, if I could go back in time, so if we would have asked that question in two th from 2018 forward, how are you involving patients? Then at some point we would have get, gotten a sense of, okay, this I think is good. This is, is, is less good. And then you could switch again to say, okay, are you involving patients at the beginning of the process, for example? Or are you asking patients how they would like to be involved at the beginning of the process? So uh, I think as a regulator, um, to, to, to quote Uncle Sam from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. I think your, your question is spot on, Jane, because the way we ask the question has an enormous impact on how healthcare providers act. Um, and, and so if we ask it wrong or if it can be interpreted the wrong way, we can actually increase the burden or increase uh, uh, harm even instead of decreasing it or improving uh, a care. So this is absolutely one of our um, our struggles. So I would say, once you see that they are being involved, then you should be asking how are they being involved? And at some point you should organize something to create a standard of some sort on how patients uh, should be involved. And that, that standard, whatever format it would be, I would imagine, would be largely, uh, would exist largely out of empowering the people and giving them the choice of how they want to be involved and what the goal of the adverse event investigation would be for them. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, I'm going to come to Jamila now. I think mine overlap quite a bit with James, actually. So I've got a conflict of interest. I'm a clinician and, so, and, and I'm very new to patient safety, so I don't know the evidence base. I'm not steeped in it. But I think one thing that really struck me is if the regulators have so much power, actually, and they're so effective, how, what is the evidence base around the potential harm they can do? Yeah. What's the evidence base on how they are involving the public in determining what this regulation is? Um, because I think there was a lot of focus on how institutions do that, rightly so. But I just wondered if the regulators are so powerful and so important, um, what the evidence base around that is. Um, yeah, so that, <laughs> that's a painful question. 
because, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm very happy to, uh, that uh, people like uh, uh, Jane and uh, people around the world are doing research into regulation, uh, but um, there's not much proof of the added value of regulation. Uh, there, there is some, uh, and there is also quite some research showing that it has no um, impact. And there's also quite some research showing that it has a negative impact. And I know from my practice, I can give multiple examples of all three. Um, so I absolutely feel, but that's also, of course, my job. So I'm preaching to the choir. And I guess you guys are joining this webinar because you're interested in this theme. I feel there should be more research on, on, on the impact that the regulation has and on how regulation can create societal value instead of uh, a bureaucratic burden, uh, et cetera. And I do feel that the CQC is, is doing good work on this too. So just to do a little shout out to my English colleagues, <laughs> it's not all bad out there. Uh, we are really trying to, to find out what it is that makes us worthwhile. And um, yeah, but it's, it's a pretty young uh, a research uh, field, certainly in healthcare. Thank you, Ian, and Jenna for asking the question. Jane Moran, I think this will be the final question because we've got just two minutes. So, Jane, you're finishing us off. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. No pressure. Thanks, Ian, for that. I really enjoyed that. Having been a, a senior sort of nurse manager in the past, I've been involved in a lot of these kind of situations, investigations, get trying to get do the right thing, involve families, involve patients, get everybody around the table, as it were, to, to try and find out what was at the bottom of what happened. And uh, I think it is quite a threatening thing for uh, everybody involved. And as you've already alluded to, clinicians that get involved in these situations, they do find it very difficult to be open and honest, and they do feel like they're laying themselves open to... Uh, yeah, difficult consequences by admitting to certain things or just being honest. Yeah. And it really affects the, you know, in one particular example example I can think of, you know, the family came away feeling a lot worse than they had prior to that that meeting just because of the demeanour of this person, because he was quite threatened and, you know, and it was hard to explain to them, well, actually it's quite difficult for him as well. And yeah. uh, I just wondered if, you know, you'd been involved in any kind of, and I know it's probably an acknowledged thing, but is there any uh, training or intervention that anyone's ever tested, you know, to work with clinicians to make that a better experience for them and for everybody to be able to make that a worthwhile experience? Yeah, no, absolutely there is. And I know of uh, um, Dutch initiatives in this. I mean, that's not of much help to you, but uh, absolutely. So there, you could either... So there's like the... Um, the whole organization culture change thing that you say, you know, we have to be open because we're learning from this and we're not blaming anybody. And, and they have to like experience that that is true because mm. only one person has to have the experience that it's not true. And that kind of seeps through the organization yeah. and years later, people are still talking about it. Yeah. And there's the just on time training uh, that is also being uh, done here in the Netherlands. There's uh, this company, uh, this um, um it's not a commercial company, but but like a company that 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 uh, helps hospitals or other healthcare providers do this. So so when a doctor or a healthcare professional is involved in a serious adverse event and and is going to talk to the family or the next of kin or the patient, then they get a quick just in time training on how to do this, um, because they realize exactly where your point. So that these healthcare professionals also have all these emotions. Mm. And people just react differently to stress. Mm. And some people, uh, yeah, they, they make a mess out of it. <laughs> yeah. And they don't mean to, uh, but it's the emotions. And maybe they're having a bad time at home too, and they've slept bad, or they have problems with their wife, or their, their own father was dying, or, you know, there's all this stuff happening in your life. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, you have to be there for the patient, uh, but you also take yourself with, with you to that conversation. So I totally recognize what you're saying. And um, and this is a really important issue because you only get one chance to do it right. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So if you want if you want more information on that, you can contact me and I can connect you with those Dutch people who do this. And they might know of people uh, from English talking, English speaking nations that, that might do the same kind of stuff. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you.
Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, for those wise words to finish with there, Ian, um, we really appreciate you coming along and talking to us today and to the audience for uh, listening and for providing such positive feedback and such great questions. So just a, a round of applause from, from us all. Uh, Ian, I'll, I'll be in touch soon thank to follow much. up because I think there's plenty of opportunities for collaboration across the groups. And uh, thank you once again. All right, thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Thanks, everybody.